Can you imagine being bad at beer pong? Well, I certainly can, but what if I wasn't? What if I was good? Or what if I had a machine that was good for me? Let's dive into the technical details and find out why I had to iterate over and over again to get this contraption running. Welcome to NB Engineering. Now here's our game plan. Imagine having a two-dimensional world. In this plane, we have a throwbot consisting of a body and an arm that pivots around this point. The bracket at the end of the arm holds the object we want to throw. And we have a target. In this case, it's a table with a hole in it. As the arm rotates and stops again, the object starts flying. In this specific example, we didn't care how hard the robot launched the object, which is why it didn't go in. But we can calculate. By shifting the origin of our coordinate system to the release point of the launch and then measuring the distances to our target in X and Y, we can calculate the trajectory and the release speed for a given throw angle. Now let's make this thing. I will build a small version of the robot first that will allow me to verify my concepts and ideas in mechanics and software and then afterward I'm going to build a big version of it. When assembling aluminum frames, you should always do so on a straight surface to ensure the structure makes a perfect rectangle. I am mainly using 3D printed parts for the robot. That is super cheap and fast. And here it is, the Throwbot V1. In this example, I'm using it to throw table tennis balls into this cup. Let's give it a try. Okay, I made some changes to the software. Now let's try again. That one was perfect. But how does it know how to hit the target? When throwing table tennis balls yourself, you might think that scoring depends on luck. That's not true we can precisely calculate using fundamental laws of physics. The ball follows a curved path in our throwbot application because of gravitation, which is one of Newton's laws. It says that gravitational force between two objects is proportional to the mass of these objects, in this case, ball and earth. So if the ball is launched with a constant horizontal velocity v0, but is drawn down by gravity simultaneously, it will follow the curved trajectory we all know. It will follow the curved trajectory. It won't. Seems like we forgot the drag. Drag, also known as air resistance, is what slows down flying objects in the air. Here's the equation and here's its legend. But what matters is that the drag force is proportional to the square of the object's velocity. I illustrated this for you in this simulation. So in addition to the initial velocity v0 and the gravitational force fg, the drag force reduces the ball's velocity. This results in trajectories that no longer look like perfect parabolas, but more like this. So the throwbot takes information about the distance and height of the target that I provide to it and feeds it into magic algorithms that calculate the release angle and speed based on the three forces I just explained. This information is then given to another fancy algorithm that converts it into instructions for the stepper motor. The motor executes these instructions and entirely misses the target. Even after a super accurate release speed calculation, the ball won't go in every time for every distance. If I tune the parameters to hit targets very far away, it won't hit targets very close and vice versa. I thought long, maybe too long about this problem. 
and I eventually decided to install an IMU on the arm to have a look at the angular acceleration and velocity during the throw. But what is an IMU? An inertial measurement unit is a device that can measure its orientation in three-dimensional space and reports this information to a microcontroller. It does so by using an accelerometer to recognize acceleration along its main axis and a gyroscope that gives information about the rotation around these axes. After combining this information by feeding it through calculations and filters, I can log the angle and angular velocity over time and plot it out after the throw. After I installed the IMU and looked at the angular velocity measurements, I discovered the problem that makes my throws inaccurate the natural frequency of the arm. If you give an impulse to an object, it starts to vibrate. And if the object is not obstructed, it will do so at its natural frequency. Because the stepper motor I am using has to go through a wide range of step frequencies to accelerate and decelerate, at some point it will step at the natural frequency of the arm. In the following, we will refer to the step frequency of the motor as the exciter frequency omega e and to the natural frequency of the arm as omega zero. Plotting the amplitude, which is a measure of how much the arm swings, over a range of different excitement frequencies unveils the problem. Unfortunately, physics requires the arm to heavily vibrate when excited with its natural frequency. Let's have a closer look at this. This graph shows the arm's velocity over time without any vibration. And this graph shows the arm's oscillation itself. Adding both of these graphs results in something like this, which is surprisingly close to the measurements from the IMU when attached to the arm. So, I know my assessment of the problem is correct, but the corresponding solution is unbelievably complicated. Consider this example. The red line marks the exciter frequency needed for a specific throw. It is very close to the arm's natural frequency, so the arm would vibrate heavily. I need to be able to shift the arm's natural frequencies between the throws, so that a specific throw is not affected by vibration. This could be considered impossible, but guess what I did? I even got my personal health and safety supervisor to support me during assembly. The first tests of the new machine quickly showed the forces involved are unlike those of V1 and the material I used was clearly not made for them. This is why I contacted my friend Danny D who is known for ridiculously over engineering everything. He helped me out by printing the parts of the center joint out of insane glass fiber reinforced material on his industry like 3D printer. Another tricky problem I had to solve was clamping the ball. A ball-like holding fixture like V1 obviously causes the throwbot to lose the ball if it travels more than half a turn. That's why I came up with a design that uses a servo-driven hold-down clamp to keep the ball in place until it is time to throw. All in all, the arm got so heavy that I had to switch to the next bigger stepper motor. This included redesigning and reprinting a lot of parts. And then, after some hardcore flowcharts, hardcore coding and hardcore wiring, the machine was ready to be put to the test. Uh, the results using the hold down clamp were rather disappointing. Ladies and gentlemen, I proudly introduce you to failure.
I think this looks like the ball is thrown away rather unmotivatedly instead of being brought precisely to the target. Let's analyze. We're simulating a throw that matches our assumptions. On the graph you can see the distance phi that the arm traveled over the time t. The first thing that becomes obvious to me is that there is no real bend in the graph that could stand for the drop point of the ball. That means there is no instantaneous separation of the ball and arm, which could lead to a suction effect that keeps the ball in place longer than anticipated. But if you play the simulation in slow motion, it becomes obvious that the arm's circular motion collides with the ball's parabolic motion. There is actually no way the ball leaves the bowl uninterrupted. And that means I get to redesign the entire release mechanism. The design I was happy with after several iterations is this one. It uses two servo-driven arms that are connected via gears. This release method turned out to be incredibly reliable. And now I will show you what this thing is capable of. Have fun! Okay, isn't that great? I would say we are at about 25% hit rate right now. Sometimes it still does weird stuff. But even though 25% is way better than any of my friends, I still need to address two more things before I can attend a match against them. First, in a perfect world, the ball would always follow the calculated trajectory and hit the target perfectly. But influences such as vibrations, air resistance and draft change the trajectory slightly. So if the robot always makes the same mistake for a specific cup, I know that the influences of the particular distance and speed add up to that exact mistake. This is why I programmed an offset matrix into my software, so that I have the opportunity to correct for errors while playing a beer pong game. And second, frequency shifting. To solve the vibration problem we encountered with the first generation, I developed a system to shift the arm's natural frequency as described before. Whenever the arm is vertical, a slotted pulley on the arm aligns with the shaft of this motor. If it turns, the torque is transferred via this belt, these 3D printed bevel gears and another belt onto these lead screws. They move weights along the arm's axis which shifts its natural frequency. I then attached an even better IMU on the arm and wrote software that tracks and analyzes every movement of it. Let me show you. This graph shows the angular velocity of the arm with the weights in an unfavorable position. And this graph shows the exact same throw with the weights in a perfect position, as there is a much smaller amount of vibration close to the release point. And just like that, we are ready for a final match. But I didn't bring opponents, I brought the opponents. Maybe too confident, I decided to give them a little head start. Okay, they're down to three. Now let's start up the robot.
Now the last one. What a journey. I spent nine months engineering, manufacturing and testing this thing and I'm super happy with the results. I am really looking forward to bringing new engineering projects on this channel and I already have some wild designs in my head. If you liked the video, please let me know. Thank you very much for watching.